They can take your world. This is not happening. They can take your heart. It can't be happening. It can't. Cut you loose from all you know. What happened to my home? My island? What did he mean? End up like Riku. But if it's your fate? Well, I didn't ask for this. I've been having these weird thoughts lately. Without them, I... Like... All my strength came from them. They gave me all of it. Is any of this for real? Alone? Or not? I'm worthless. Sora has shown us time and again throughout Kingdom Hearts that smile that lights up a room, that encourages his friends to keep pushing through the darkness no matter how deep it is. But something has always felt off when I see Sora being happy. Call me an empath, y'all. <laughs> I kept experiencing this throughout the games and it was always stuck in the back of my head. This question of, is Sora really this happy? Today I wanted to break down why I think that maybe there is more to this than meets the eye. Hi, I'm Byroxus. I usually do deep dives into the mechanics and animations from the Kingdom Hearts series. I've been itching to dive deep into the psyche of Sora for years at this point. I've spent a lot of time learning about psychology and mental health, and wanted to get my two cents on this topic while also tying into Kingdom Hearts 4 and my hopes for the development of Sora's character. I also have another person who has his own experience in the psychology field to join me. Hi, I'm John from the Thought Bubble YouTube channel, and I have my master's degree in clinical mental health counseling, and I think that Sora is a really nuanced character who's often unfairly boiled down to being defined by his happy-go-lucky attitude, even though there's a lot more to him than that. I imagine if you clicked on a video about the psychology of a main character, you probably don't need an introduction to this series, but here's the rundown. It's the best. Okay, moving on. Seriously though, this franchise has it all. The struggle between light and darkness, the power of friendship, talking animals that team up with anime boys, all who skip their dinner. Kingdom Hearts also takes on deeper topics though, like depression and loneliness, but not in such an outspoken way. You aren't going to hear a character yell about how much they want to cry or how upset they are. Typically they go from smiling and laughing to... Why are we still here? And if you're observant enough, you may be able to catch these cracks in the mask of happiness throughout this franchise. Sora is a character that always wants others to be happy and will bend over backwards to make that happen, going so far as to shove his own feelings deep, deep down to ensure he does not bother others. It really sheds some light on this idea of toxic positivity and how much it impacts Sora. We see throughout the games that Sora tries to smile despite him fearing for his friends. This pain is present throughout the series and cracks really begin to show in Kingdom Hearts 3. Without further ado or introduction, let's begin our deep dive into the psychology of Sora. The best place to kick this off, of course, is at the beginning. At the start of Kingdom Hearts 1, Sora is separated from his island and friends, waking up in a place completely foreign to him. As he looks for his friends, he isn't even able to process the trauma of seeing his friends lost right before his eyes. Practically the first message he receives from Donald and Goofy is, be happy or you can't go with us. No problem, no sad friends, okay? Yeah, you gotta look funny, like us. <laughs> yep. Whoa. Yes, but ones have happy faces. This scene really shows how comments, even innocuous ones that aren't even meant to be malicious, can have an impact. It's laughed off here, but it's an important milestone in the relationship Sora has with Donald and Goofy. It's even reinforced near the end of the game when Donald and Goofy remind Sora that he shouldn't be sad. The moment is quickly swept aside though as Sora has a vision of Kairi. Another important moment is during the deep jungle world. Donald and Sora get into a fight and Sora is quick to shift to solo mode out of anger stopping himself from worrying about Donald and Goofy due to their disagreement. This may be rooted in a feeling of insignificance for Sora. We see in the Olympus Coliseum how Sora reacts to Phil calling him a pipsqueak. Sora is desperate to prove himself to everyone and not be known as a weak crybaby. He even shows off for Riku when Riku is talking about taking care of everything. This desperation is rooted in power. He wants to have the power to protect what matters, and part of him fears he may not be enough. Showing this fear though isn't really something Sora is comfortable with and only appears when Sora is overwhelmed by his emotions. 
Riku takes advantage of these insecurities, so it has, and the fear he holds in his heart, taking over the Keyblade for a short period of time at the end of KH1. Sora doesn't believe in himself, and the pain of losing his friends in this moment is something that hurt him deeply. It resurfaces in Chain of Memories as Sora brings it up, and Donald makes the remark that he wished that Sora had forgotten that. Sora has always had this fear that maybe he isn't good enough, and it's interesting how he can find pieces of that even as far back as the first game. He tries to hide this fear with a positive smile and continues to push down his other feelings, relying on his friends to become his power. Now of course I'm not saying friends are bad for you, we see what isolation leads to in later games and what that pain of loneliness can bring about. I think what it comes down to is balance. A balance of having a strong base and being able to be alone as well as having support from your friends. When we reach Kingdom Hearts 3 we'll see why both are important. The last thing I want to point out actually comes from the ending cutscene. Sora has this tell when he is pushing down his emotions. During this last part, we see Sora and Kairi separated, and as the gulf widens between them, Sora clenches his hand and smiles at her. After she disappears and he's alone, his smile fades. As we move throughout the games, you'll see this close-up shot of his hand clenching during intense moments. It seems like his reaction when emotions get high, and it's probably an involuntary coping skill to deal with his emotions. I'll try to note this motion as we move throughout the rest of the games, but I may miss it, so try to keep your eyes peeled as we're showing different cutscenes. Let's move our attention to Chain of Memories. Now, Sora's development throughout the course of this game is fascinating because this is where we can see some of the anger he has displayed in the first game take more of a center stage. While it's undeniable that this ship runs on happy faces, interacting with organization members like Larxene, Axel, Marluxia, and Vexen as his memories are being tampered with by Naminé shows us a darker side of Sora that as the series progresses he has been able to mask more and more with his signature positive attitude. <laughs> But I think we need to talk about how Sora copes with all of his negative experiences and emotions as he, Donald, and Goofy progress further and further into Castle Oblivion. While it starts from sadness and guilt stemming from being unable to remember who Naminé is, which is massively exacerbated by Larxene when she helps him to figure out who she's supposedly supposed to be based on the memories Naminé herself has implanted into his mind, it's from here that we see Sora who is very confused, upset, and frustrated trying to wrap his mind around what could possibly be going on. And what's interesting is that after he meets Vexen's replica Riku, Jiminy, Donald, and Goofy say this. Instead of being sad, we have to figure out a way to help Riku get his memory back. If we all work together, why we're sure to get you through this. No need to mow. Jiminy's right. You shouldn't push your friends away. Yeah. Okay. This is a key example of how when Sora attempts to manage his emotions, instead of learning to accept and work through some of these more negative feelings, he's again told that he needs to smile and keep moving forward, just like in the first game. But I think that Chain of Memories does a great job at chipping away at the flaws in this smile the sad away Disney mindset. Should happiness be the default emotion in every situation? Are feelings of anger and sadness really that terrible? And while don't get me wrong, this advice from his friends is definitely very well intentioned. I don't think this is exactly what Sora may have needed in the moment this advice was given to him, and in turn, creates somewhat of a maladaptive coping mechanism within him that sees him push these negative emotions further and further down. And if you aren't familiar, a maladaptive coping mechanism is any conscious or non-conscious adjustment or adaptation that attempts to decrease tension and anxiety in a stressful experience, but doesn't provide adequate or appropriate adjustment to the environment or situation. Knowing what we know now, it's unsurprising that he doesn't quite know what to do when he's trying to manage these more negative emotions, oftentimes defaulting to putting a smile on his face and carrying on like nothing bad is happening and having very explosive emotional reactions when this doesn't work. A prime example of this in Chain of Memories is when Sora lashes out at Donald and Goofy for simply suggesting that they need to slow down and think about what's really happening in the castle, which, let's be honest, isn't a bad idea. I'm wrong. 
Fine, then don't believe me. That's not what he meant. We're just kind of worried. Then let's ask Naminé. That should clear it up. Look, we don't have time to sit around, so let's go! Sora, what happened to you? What's that mean? Well, you always get real touchy when it comes to stuff about Naminé. But before we came to this castle, you didn't even remember what her name was. Now Naminé's the only thing you talk about. It doesn't make sense. Maybe you should just slow down and think ahead about some of these things. Think ahead? What is the matter with you guys? Do you want me to abandon her? No, that's not it. Then do whatever you want. You can lay back and take a nap for all I care. I'm going to find Naminé. Sorry! And it's not really this idea that makes him upset, to be fair. In this situation, Sora is displacing his guilt and anger about forgetting everything about someone who he now believes was such an important part of his life. And so, for someone who is focused on the connections between friends, instead of coping with these negative feelings about himself in that moment, he throws all of these feelings at his friends and angrily runs off, leaving them in the dust. Now, of course, they reunite with him shortly after after this and he is able to eventually bounce back after meeting Naminé in person, I think the Chain of Memories is arguably the most consistently transparent Sora is when expressing his emotions. It's interesting to see how Kingdom Hearts 2 further develops these ideas based on how Sora interacts with the world and the characters around him. Kingdom Hearts 2 actually addresses Sora's emotional state really well at times. There's this moment here when Sora is leaving Twilight Town, and he expresses sadness over leaving Hainer, Pence, and Olette. He even tells Donald and Goofy he's feeling sad. So at this point, he doesn't completely feel an inability to communicate his feelings. This probably comes from Roxas being in his heart and him voicing those feelings. It's like Sora can voice those feelings because he isn't sure why he is feeling it. We see a similar thing happen back in Birth by Sleep. Sora, what's wrong? Huh? You're... Uh, that's weird. It's like something's squeezing me inside. When Sora returns to Twilight Town, there is this scene where he learns that Kyrie has been kidnapped. Hainer apologizes and Sora immediately without even thinking tries to cheer him up before dropping the facade and instead saying, Like I can even say that. This uncertainty probably stems from Saix poking at the sadness in his heart. Xemnas backs this up even by saying that he wanted Saix to create hesitation in him, which would lead to anger. After Sora leaves Twilight Town, he mourns the loss of his friends again, though this time Donald responds with, don't be sad, and Goofy makes a comment about Sora being the connection between them all, which Sora takes to mean that it's all his fault. Goofy tries to backpedal in this comment since that wasn't really his intention, but the damage has already been done. Donald and Goofy attempt to make Sora feel better, and he thanks them, but his voice doesn't have his usual positive ring to it. Thanks, guys. Sora, at this point in the journey, can't even bring himself to fake being positive. It's one of the few moments that we actually see him drop that facade. There's also this scene after the Thousand Heartless battle where Sora wonders if it was all for nothing. There's this deep sadness that is beginning to form inside Sora. In the Pride Lands, courage and a strong heart are reinforced for Sora. Being told that his battle will probably never end and that he needs to stay strong would definitely continue to encourage Sora's thinking of how important it is to stay positive. And that's really all there is for Kingdom Hearts 2's cutscenes. While there isn't a ton of emotional development for Sora here, we do see some reinforcement of his emotional coping. Let's look at a game that really helps us see a bit deeper into the way Sora copes and deals with his emotions. Coded has these brief moments that really shine a lot on Sora's character. To preface this part of the video, this Sora is the data version, but is almost a perfect replica of Sora down to his memories and personality, so I feel like it is safe to project what we see with Data Sora onto the real one. The first thing I want to point out is when this data version of Riku is talking to Sora. There is this post arc plot where Sora learns of the pain and hurt that Kairi and Riku were experiencing. Riku asks Sora what he would have done if he knew that they were hurting. Sora immediately answers that even thinking that he would have tried to help, to figure out a way to undo that hurt. 
It has reinforced to Sora that it is a good thing that he always tries to help others despite what happens to him. Riku likens him to a sponge, something that will suck up all the bad and leave things a little bit better. This really didn't sit well with me. This idea that Sora should give up more of himself in order for everyone around him to feel better is an isolating concept. If Sora ever feels hurt himself, how could he ever reach out for help knowing that it may hurt those around him to know he is feeling sad? While we never get confirmation of this, it is pretty safe to assume after everything we have seen of Sora's character that he would be hard pressed to reach out to others if he was feeling this way. Sora then experiences heartache for what he believes is the first time. We see in Birth by Sleep though that he has experienced this before, but he doesn't have the words or experience to really understand and communicate what it is that he's feeling. The next scene tackles this idea of loneliness. Sora doesn't like it, in fact, he hates it. He's even able to identify that this is a kind of pain and that it may even pull him into the darkness if he let it. This is a really insightful moment for Sora. We see him steal his resolve though and tell himself that he can do it. Sora holds onto this hurt and pain that he experiences because it connects him with others. His fear of loneliness is stronger than the pain he is feeling inside, and so, in order to not lose anyone, he holds on and pushes forward. I think this is a really powerful moment in showing how easy it is to say that Sora's idea of hurt or pain is juvenile. I mean, Roxas is sent into an angry frenzy because he feels that Sora is diminishing what it means to truly hurt. The power of Sora's ability to connect with others though helped Sora understand Roxas' pain, and again we get this snapshot of Sora's thought process. If his hurt is able to bring him closer to others, then maybe it's not so bad. So we know that Sora can own that hurt, but we have yet to see him share that with others, just be a sponge for that hurt. Lastly is this scene with Namine. Sora finds out that there are memories that rest within him. Memories of pain and hurt that belong to the Sea Salt Trio, Namine, and the Wayfinder Trio. Namine makes this statement that there are two types of pain. One can be wiped away, but the other has to be faced head on and accepted. Namine makes the point that if it becomes too much to bear, he can turn to a friend. Mickey even reminds him that he's there for him. That's the thing with Sora though. Rarely does he ever turn to someone else. Yes, he knows that his friends are his power, but in the back of his mind is always that notion that he is theirs as well, and so in order to not hurt them, he buries his own hurt deep down inside. And that is it for Coded. Let's look at the next game. In Dream Drop Distance, I think we can all agree that Sora didn't go through an incredible amount of character development, but instead, this title really serves to put both his positive and negative attributes on full display. For the purposes of what we're talking about though, I think that Sora's positivity, dedication to helping his friends, and impulsivity are particularly highlighted, which, while oftentimes his gut serves him really well, it also pushes him further and further further into danger throughout the course of this game, and I think that the stage is truly set just before the Mark of Mastery exam starts, when Sora states that he, Riku, and Mickey were already worthy of being called Keyblade Masters, and even when Riku wants to take the test, Sora immediately agrees to take it as well, but still kind of quips that it'll be a piece of cake, not quite taking it too seriously. One of my favorite parts of Dream Drop Distance is that it clearly illustrates that yes, of course Sora is great at believing in his friends, he would do anything for them, and would always believe in the good in others, which is one of his greatest strengths. But in this game, that idea can be kind of flipped on its head, and it's used against him. Whenever he's faced with adversity in this game, he just keeps pushing forward and following his heart, because that's all he's ever really had to do, and it doesn't often steer him wrong. But I think a great example of when it does is in the grid, when Sora realizes that Rinsler is actually Tron. As Sora is trying to reach his old friend Tron, who even if he were to save him, wouldn't remember him anyways because he's in a sleeping world. During this confrontation, he unintentionally puts his new friend Korra's life at risk. Whether it's when he meets Pinocchio and Jiminy in Prankster's Paradise, Mickey, Donald, and Goofy in the country of the Musketeers, or Tron in the grid, Sora always has a particularly tough time with the idea that his friends that he cares about so much just don't recognize him here. And so while he usually snaps out of it pretty quickly, this confrontation with Rensler was different because they're on opposing sides now. The idea of not being able to bring Tron back to his senses wasn't even an option in Sora's mind because he likely didn't want to cope with the potential implications of that. And so he tried to reason with him in hopes to re 
reach his heart, which is a very Sora thing to do, but instead Tron doesn't come to his senses and instead attacks him. Because at this moment, Sora doesn't quite know how to process that his plan didn't work and he wasn't able to reach through to Tron, he defaults to a more positive thought, saying that, you know, he just needs time. Almost feels like he's trying to convince himself of it. So while Sora is stunned, Korra moves to engage Tron, who handily knocks her out and escapes. And while this is just one example, it shows us very distinctly how Sora is able to manage these sorts of situations where his positivity and optimism are challenged. And to be fair, it did all work out, and Sora was right that Tron was still in there deep down, that doesn't change the fact that when he wasn't able to reach through to his friend initially, he froze. Before trying to rationalize and dispel some of his negative feelings with this idea that Tron just needs time, instead of making sure to stay on guard so that his other friend Korra wouldn't get hurt. Now this is all explained very pointedly to Riku at the end of the game when Diz exposition dumps and states that all Sora needs to do is to be himself and he will be able to save everyone. I think that this could be misinterpreted though to mean that all Sora has to do is stay irrationally happy and he'll save everyone, but I think that following where his heart takes him and shoving down all negative emotions with this inclination to stay positive at all times are not the same thing. And so while Sora appeared incredibly happy for Riku passing the Mark of Mastery exam, even though he failed and lost all of his powers in the process, we begin to see the cracks in this facade show more and more, especially at the beginning of Kingdom Hearts 3. Kingdom Hearts 3 has a lot of these underlying issues start to come to a head, and one of the nice things about KH3 is how animated the characters have become and how well emotion shows up on their faces. I mean, you can tell this in the first 10 minutes of the game when recapping Dream Drop Distance. You can see that sullen expression he has when hearing of his downfall, followed by these goofy poses when they decide to go to Olympus to meet Herc. The goofiness is just for show though, as we see a few offhanded comments from Pete and Maleficent about how weak Sora has become, rip that mask right off of Sora. Not even 10 minutes later, and a saved citizen chinks away some more at Sora's confidence. Zigbar then shows up to sink the final sword between that armor, insinuating that having a good heart and caring for others would end up getting Sora hurt. Zigbar even goads Sora on, telling him not to change even though he just said that if he continues, he would end up breaking some of those hearts. Sora is obviously shaken up by this comment, and his friends try to cheer him up. It seems to work and he puts on a good face to make them feel better, but trails behind, showing that Zigbar's words hit their mark. It's like beating a dead horse how often Sora's weakness is brought up since as soon as Sora returns to Yensid's tower, it's immediately brought up again. Sora even forgets about his dealings with Maleficent and Zigbar, but when Goofy offers for them to return to tell Yensid, Sora says something interesting. No, the others have already got enough on their plates as it is. Why go stressing them out? The three of us know how to handle a couple of old adversaries, right? But doesn't that thing Pete said bother you? The black box? Come on, we're talking about Pete. That means it's probably no big deal. Oh, I don't know. This stays in line with the sore we have seen time and again, afraid to be a burden on others, wanting those around him to be carefree. We then get this great scene paralleling Sora and Data Sora, and showing that Sora understands the meaning of hurt. Coupling this with his previous statement of not wanting to stress anyone else out, shows that he cares how others feel and would do anything to make sure that they don't feel hurt, probably taking on more than just a little of that hurt himself. If you take the intended route, not much happens with Sora's party in the Kingdom of Corona. Getting strong so he can save his friends though is still weighing on Sora, as we see in this exchange in the Gummy Ship after saving Rapunzel thinking about Roxas. He's trapped here in my heart. But he needs a body to be himself again. Toy Box gives us a little insight into Sora's want to help others. Near the end, he feels bad that he couldn't help the Toy Box crew despite it not being his fault. We've seen it before, but if Sora sees a need, he does his best to help, showing that he takes on more than is humanly possible for himself. There's this scene in Monstropolis, where Donald makes this kind of random offhand comment about how they need someone more dependable than Sora, which is why they're looking for the missing Keyblade wielders. It's hardly touched upon, but we see a lot of this poking fun from Donald. It happens in this scene in Toy Box as well. I think it's interesting how Donald can see this gets a reaction on Sora, but never addresses how it might make him feel. 
There also may be something to the idea that Sora uses his heart as his guiding key, which led him to this world where negative emotions were seen in a bad light, and laughing and being happy were seen as positives. A world completely focused on putting on a happy face and laughing seems right up Sora's alley. There's this scene where Sora does his funny face special, a callback to Kingdom Hearts 1, where Donald and Goofy tell him that the gummy ship only runs on happy faces. Near the end, Sully and Mike make this comment about how it's time to let the scary out. It's very subtle, but kind of indicating that there is a time and place for all kinds of emotions. At one point, like Benita says, this world is run by screams. There was a pendulum effect where Mike and Sully thought they should only power things with laughter. It's never expanded upon, but all of our emotions are indicators. Emotions can feel positive or negative, and an emotion is not inherently negative despite what our social norms may say. Things like sadness or anger are not negative emotions, they just indicate that there's something wrong. Sadness indicates that we've lost something of value. Anger is something that indicates that we feel like something is not justified or is not fair. The Winnie the Pooh section shows Sora's fear of losing his place in his friends' hearts. He would do anything to stay connected with his friends, no matter what the cost. Except I can feel it. Our connection's weaker. Why is that? In Arendelle, Sora relates to Anna since he felt like Elsa and Riku were similar in how they pushed others away in order to not hurt them. We see those cracks at Sora's self-esteem and his strength in the scene where Sora is told he still needs the power of waking if he wants to go save Aqua. We can see how all these comments impact Sora, but he doesn't ever confront others, letting them have their laugh. I really wonder how much this impacts Sora. <laughs> oh. Tomorrow's fight will be our toughest yet. I want to be a part of your life no matter what. That's all. Oh. Mm. Kyrie, I'll keep you safe. Mm -mm. Let me keep you safe. When Sora loses all of his friends in the Keyblade Graveyard, we finally see true despair in his deepest fears. I'll keep you safe. He is afraid that he is worthless if he is alone. Without people to protect or give him strength, he feels worthless. During the end of Kingdom Hearts 3, when Sora returns from the final world, we see something really unique, though it is extremely subtle. Sora doesn't put on a smiling face for his friends. He openly cries in front of them. He laments Kairi being gone and doesn't try to hide his feelings to not burden others. And I'm really excited to see what that means in the future of Kingdom Hearts. Now that's not to say that Sora is completely changed, right? Like all of his maladaptive coping skills from before are still present and will probably show up in the future. But it is interesting to see just that slight difference in Sora's demeanor at the end of Kingdom Hearts 3. It makes me excited to see what will happen with Sora in the future games. So throughout all of this, we get all these snapshots of Sora, but I want to take a step back and look at the full picture. Obviously we've pointed out a lot of cutscenes and a lot of different things throughout all the games, and I want to make sure that we're leaving at the end of this with a full idea of what we're trying to get across. While throughout the course of the franchise we see without a shadow of a doubt that Sora believes that his friends are his power, I think it's very likely that he's scared that he may not be theirs. 
In this effort to be strong for his friends, his conclusion is that he shouldn't show his own pain or sadness. In Sora's mind, if he's weak, that equates to being a burden to them. In this same vein, if his friends are hurting, he will do everything he can to take on that burden. I think the best way we see this encapsulated is with Data Riku's analogy of Sora being like a sponge. He will work to make things better even if he is damaged or thrown away in the process. This shows us that Sora's self-esteem is not the strongest, or rather that he strengthens his self-esteem based on how his friends are feeling. If his friends are okay, then he is okay. If they aren't okay, then he isn't okay. Because of this, his friend's emotional state takes precedence over his own. Time and time again, we see Sora throw himself forward without a care for his own well-being because he perceives that his friends are in danger. Despite everything he has done, Sora doubts himself greatly. This is where darkness seeps in, and why Sora's darkness may be growing throughout the series. This fear and worry that he isn't enough pushes him to try to grow stronger. His darkness starts as a small shadow during KH1, but quickly grows throughout the series. Sora's need to be strong for his friends moves him closer to the darkness as he almost willingly isolates himself and strives to save everyone. It actually reminds me of this scene in Kingdom Hearts 3 when young Xehanort states that the darkness of being alone is something that can be powerful. It's really interesting how in an effort to connect and help others, which is what Sora sees as the power of light, he actually cuts himself off allowing darkness to grow. For just a simple example, in the final battle with Xehanort, he tries to leave Donald and Goofy behind and go it alone, thinking he needs to keep everyone safe. Sora is constantly trying to take on the burden alone so that his friends don't get hurt. He strives for a power to save his friends, which sometimes leads to him being consumed by darkness. Rage form and anti form, while never directly referenced or explained in the games really, shows this quite well. In a Famitsu interview, Nomura notes that he added anti form as a way to punish the player for utilizing drives too often. In Sora's effort to become stronger through the use of drives, something literally built off using the power of his teammates, darkness seeps in, leaving him alone. I also think it's interesting that these powerful drive forms also tend to isolate Sora, though I'm sure that's really just a balancing aspect for gameplay. This darkness inside Sora wraps up into his anger at being weak, and culminates in Rage Form, where Sora is not completely taken over by darkness, but is still tainted by it. Of course, Rage Form isn't the first time that we've seen Sora taken over by rage, as we've seen through a lot of the cutscenes in this video. And that's all my thoughts on Sora and the full picture of Sora. I want to let Thought Bubble also give his thoughts real quick, so I'll throw it over to him. If we loop back to this idea that Sora doesn't like to show this weakness around his friends because he doesn't want to be a burden on them, the question inevitably comes up, what happens to all of these negative emotions if he's not expressing them? Well, put quite simply, Sora, whether consciously or not, chooses to repress these painful and uncomfortable memories so that he doesn't have to deal with processing all of them throughout the course of his journey. But as you would likely expect, Sora's repression of these emotions only quote unquote works for so long because when pushed to his breaking point like he is in Castle Oblivion, Sora just kind of explodes like he does when he leaves Donald and Goofy in the dust. And in turn, Sora's inability to regulate his emotion makes him a prime target to be manipulated by Xehanort in the organization because members like Larxene, Marluxia, and Zigbar know just how to push his buttons and get him closer and closer to flying off the handle. I mean, if we're honest, the organization in general in Kingdom Hearts 2 really set Sora on edge to the point that when he kills Demix, he, as Donald so aptly points out, angrily antagonizes the rest of the organization organization to become his next victim. Well, this could be chalked up by some of Roxas's influence, I think that at this point in the game, Sora has so much pent up aggression that he is more than ready to release on anyone who will get in his way before Donald and Goofy kind of recenter him. But sometimes, if the negative emotions are too great, he completely freezes in adversity. I think that the moment in the Keyblade graveyard really underscores how he copes with being under such heavy duress. Because in the moment that he needed to be strong, he needed to fight, and he needed to keep his emotions in check, he wasn't able to because he's never learned how to effectively communicate or process his emotions. And so in turn, he, like many of us would have, crumbles. He has so profoundly bought into this belief that his friends are his power, which in many ways is true, 
This idea has become kind of a double-edged sword in his case because it's led him to disregard his own strength. He is so fully bought into this idea that without his friends he's helpless, he doesn't even truly acknowledge that Riku was still there fighting with him. And while in the final world he is able to find the resolve to save his friends, I wouldn't exactly say he changes. He remains headstrong in bringing his friends back and recklessly uses the power of waking to do so. And as much as I would like to say that he has this revelation that he has strength even when he's apart from his friends, this doesn't necessarily happen. He continues to do what he's always done, and by nature of Sora being an optimistic guy who would sacrifice anything and everything for his friends, he continues to frequently do so, and by the end of Kingdom Hearts 3, it gets him into more trouble than he's really ever been in before, completely disappearing from the world. While on the surface, I think it's easy for him to be dismissed as overly positive and optimistic to the degree that I'm sure loads of people may find his character to be almost one-dimensional, but when you really start to dig below the surface, you'll see just how incredible of a character Sora really is. He, just like anyone, has flaws. He makes mistakes, and he's not always able to fully keep his composure. And you know what? That's okay. It's what makes him human. It's easy to point out where all of these cracks might be from the outside looking in. In, but the fact of the matter is that these struggles, when paired with his strength to keep moving forward, and his ability to find a solution no matter how impossible the odds are is what makes Sora, Sora. My only wish is that as the series moves forward, he is able to continue to learn and grow from these past experiences, and while he will certainly stumble in the future, just like we all will, he has created such an incredible support system that regardless of what happens next, they will pick him up whenever he gets knocked down. There's a reason why so many people refer to him as a ball of sunshine. The selflessness that Sora holds is not always a bad thing. He's able to connect with others and has a genuineness that encourages people to let their guards down. He's caring and kind, willing to do whatever it takes for his friends. He's a strong support for them, and someone who will always be by their side if they need him. Sora has good intentions, but doesn't have boundaries, which is why these good intentions end up hurting him. And that's the best thing about Sora in my opinion. As you dive into his character, you see this pretty good reflection of a real person. We all can strive towards something that we want to be like, and end up maybe crossing a boundary and hurting ourselves in the process. I think many people relate to Sora in wanting to be that same source of light for others in their life, and end up hurting themselves or pushing their own needs aside because they don't want to be a burden to others. If you do relate to this on some level, I really encourage you to rely on the friends and people you have around you. You aren't a burden. And that is the psychology of Sora. This has been a video I've been working on for years at this point, I think. I have podcasts and other stuff that I've been on where, where I've literally talked about this idea and, and wanted to get it down on paper. Um, I want to thank Fat Bubble so much. Uh, they are incredible. They have so much insight. Um, they really helped to get me to sit down and write this out. Um, it was so much fun working with somebody else on this video and, and bouncing ideas off each other and working collaboratively uh, to, to get this out. Uh, so I really hope you enjoyed. Um, a huge, huge thank you to Ryu Rush. Uh, he is the one that edited all of this together. If you guys follow me anywhere outside of YouTube, you know that I am just incredibly busy. I have a family. I have a full-time job. Uh, I just, I don't have the, the same amount of time that I used to have when I was in college. Um, so him stepping in and, and being able to, to edit this together really took such a burden off. Um, cannot thank him enough for, for all the work that he does. He actually has his commissions open. He has really good pricing. He's incredibly fast. There were so many times where he had completely finished the editing and was waiting on me to finish my lines so that he could keep working. Uh, so he was, yeah, incredible to work with. I also want to give a thank you to the community. Uh, I've had people... Um, reaching out, checking in about, you know, when is the Psychology of Sora video coming out? And honestly, that was really encouraging. I'm so glad people were looking forward to this video. And I hope that it lived up to expectations. I know it, it's been a really long time that I've been talking about this video. Uh, so hopefully you guys got something out of it. Hopefully it was something that you enjoyed. Uh, but other than that, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Please share it with somebody that you think will like it. Um, I really feel like this gives a, a side of Sora that many people kind of overlook. So... I really hope this is able to be used as like a snapshot of Sora in the Dark Seeker saga to then jump off for, you know, Cage 4 and the Lost Master arc. 
And of course, if you have any insight, I would love to hear it down in the comments below. We worked a long time on this, but obviously with such a massive project, things are gonna slip through the cracks, right? So if you wanna note things that you've seen or, or some of your own headcanons or, or thoughts and ideas, let us know down below. Or, you know, other social medias or other uh, platforms, you can add us or ping us and we'll probably respond. Of course, a huge thank you to my patrons and channel members. Uh, having just a little bit of support as I was working on this video um, and having to kind of put other projects on the back burner really helped. This is a video that definitely couldn't be done in a week, um, so I kind of had to shift my schedule and obviously you've seen my channel, so you know I've kind of gotten out of that routine anyways. Um, so having uh, a constant stream of support is really helpful in, in kind of taking the pressure off to, to rush out stuff. Um, so huge thank you to them. If you want to support as little as $1 a month, you can do that. That's all I'll say about that. <laughs> um, subscribe, share this video, comment, um, follow me on other socials. Uh, if you if you watch this far, holy crap, thank you. <laughs> um, if you watch this far, put in uh, my friends and my power or something. And uh, yeah, I think that's I think that's all. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Ideally, it's not going to take me another couple of years to get out the psychology of Riku, but that is the next one that I want to do in this series. So look forward to that, and I'll see you in the next video.